Shucky Ducky. Hello world, Lindsay here, liaison to the senior partners of Blackhorn and Lynx. Let's play Cyberhive. Austin, Texas. A police search of the residence of the suspect in the deliberate poisoning of a centuries-old treaty oak found no herbicide that would link him to the vandalism, court records showed Thursday. And the information filed in court records showed authorities did not find any occult-related items that would directly support a ritual motive for the poisoning. Paul Stedman Cullen, 45, of Elroy, Texas, has been charged with felony criminal mischief in the deliberate poisoning of the giant live oak earlier this year with the powerful herbicide Velpar. The poisoning was not discovered until late May. A search warrant filed by Sergeant John Jones, the lead investigator in the case, showed police seized a number of books and other materials from Cullen's makeshift trailer home. The search warrant was for the defoliant Velpar or any written information about the chemical, and Faney and all books, magazines, or other periodicals referring to the use of magic circles, witchcraft or the occult. The Austin American statesman has reported that Cullen was believed to have poured Velpar around the historic tree and in a magic circle to cast a spell or place a curse. In an affidavit by Jones to secure the search warrant, the investigator said an informant who had been to Cullen's home observed books and papers concerning magic circles and the occult. The affidavit also said Cullen has an Austin library card at a branch that has a copy of The Black Arts, a book that describes the making of and uses of magic circles. But authorities were unable to confirm whether Cullen checked out the book since the library only keeps records of books that are returned late. In addition to several books, police also confiscated from Cullen's home job applications, a copy of his resume, a notepad containing notes and various other records. The city has spent thousands of dollars to save the sprawling tree, removing contaminated soil from around its trunk, installing a misting system and erecting large sunshades around it. But forestry experts say it may be two or three years before it is known whether the tree will die. Parks manager Warren Struss said officials are cautiously optimistic the tree will survive. Toronto Witches, crystal ball gazers, and a woman celebrating her 23rd life gathered Friday for a gala occult fair featuring a Come As You Were reincarnation costume contest. You can buy a crystal ball here and buy a book to learn how to use it, said Donald Nossbaum, who organized the three day fifth annual Psychic, Mystics, and Seers Fair. The fair includes a series of lectures and demonstrations and 120 booths for information on the occult, clairvoyance, palmistry, astrology, and reincarnation. Exhibitors, including one who paints your aura while you wait, came from across Canada and the United States, Nossbaum said, and the fair was expected to draw about 10,000 people. Organizers billed as the special event the Come As You Were contest for reincarnates. I know there's some Elizabethan types, probably a few toads thrown in, Nossbaum said. I'm hoping for Lady Godiva. Siridwin Johnson, a psychic from Roseville, California, planned to attend as Elizabeth Mary Wiltshire a dress designer in the English courts of the early 1600s. But Johnson, 30, who in this lifetime was born in Niagara Falls, N.Y., said Elizabeth Mary is just one of 23 past lives. She has been Arthur Chambers, a U.S. military attaché from South Dakota who was shot in the back in France in 1908, and Princess Saint Edo, Indiana, 12000 B.C. in Atlantis, the fabled city lost under the sea. Johnson, who runs workshops in regressive meditation to view your past lives, said she has documented six of her own 23. She has been a man twice and a Quebec housewife betrayed by her husband Miguel in the early 1900s. She saw Miguel again in this lifetime. He's now Cory and they met in a bar in Germany when their auras crossed over. I met my former husband from my last lifetime, who I almost married this lifetime but didn't, thank God, she said. He treated me in this lifetime the same way he treated me in the last lifetime one word, infidelity. Johnson isn't married because she is searching for Terry, who she married last time when she was pub owner Michelle Bounot. Terry was Jean Guy Lafitte, she said. 
We met in France in 1327. He has a bell-shaped mole on the right buttock and his size 11 shoes and is a co-pilot with United Airlines. Los Angeles. The world is suffering from a dearth of wrapped remains, and scientists say mummies are a dying breed. In fact, the world is down to its last 1,000 mummies, making them almost an endangered species, according to an anthropologist addressing the 151st annual meeting of the Association for the Advancement of Science on Thursday. The dwindling population can be traced to such past practices as grinding them up for medicine and using them for locomotive fuel, George Armlagos, a professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, said. Over the course of 2,000 years, he said, many millions of mummies were buried in Egypt and Sudan. The sands and tombs of those countries at one time teemed with mummified remains. But hundreds of thousands were ground up and used as medicine, since it was believed the bitumen found inside the wrappings was a remedy for some ailments. In Scotland in the eerie 1600s, you could buy a pound of mummy for eight shillings. Even in the 1970s, New Yorkers interested in the occult could purchase an ounce of ground mummy for $1.40, he said. Mummies also were once used for fuel for Egyptian trains. Mummies were produced by an embalming process developed by the Egyptians about 2686 BC, he said, and while only kings were at first preserved, the practice soon spread. Mummification was helped by the dry, hot weather of the desert, which dehydrated the human tissue before it decayed. Los Angeles a self-styled witch doctor who allegedly used sex as part of his treatment of a young woman who believed she was possessed by evil spirits has been booked on suspicion of kidnapping. Jose Navarro, 63, of Stockton, California who carries business cards identifying himself as a witch doctor, was arrested after the 23-year-old woman and her 5-year-old twins were rescued by her husband, police said Sunday. The woman had reportedly contacted Navarro in Stockton on September 3 seeking his help in casting out an evil spell someone had placed on her. Shortly thereafter, the woman and her children disappeared. Navarro allegedly convinced the woman that the evil spirits would not leave her body without special treatment that included having sex with him several times, police said. He was apparently unaware that he had done anything wrong as officers booked him on kidnapping charges, Officer Lynn Blees said. Detectives found voodoo dolls and other objects associated with the occult arts in a Paseoma motel room where Navarro allegedly held the woman and her children after coming to Southern California, police said. The woman and her husband walked into a suburban police station Saturday and started telling desk officers of the situation, police said. They started telling this story and then said the guy was right outside in a car with their brother-in-law, please said. Police were unsure how the husband tracked his wife to Southern California. After several hours of sorting through the story, police booked Navarro on suspicion of kidnapping and said they would probably also seek rape charges. Navarro was held in lieu of $100,000 bail. Topeka, Kansas. Sheriff Sergeant Dan Ryan used to scoff at witchcraft, but not anymore. He took it so lightly that while investigating a prowler call at a 100-year-old house last month, he laughingly and irreverently walked through a witch's circle found in an upstairs room of the house, which some tope guns claim is used for occult ceremonies. Two car accidents and 30 stitches later, Ryan is not laughing. He is not even smirking. I did not believe in witches, but now I'm beginning to wonder, he said Thursday, referring to the strange run of bad luck he has had since he smugly walked through the circle, used during witchcraft rites. The morning after he investigated the prowler call, Ryan was sitting in his patrol car parked against a curb when another car crossed three lanes of traffic and hit him. He suffered minor back injuries and the damage to his car cost $3,800 to repair. Three days later, he fell from a bench in his garage and cut his right hand. It took 15 stitches to patch it up. And three days after that, he returned to the house only to find another bad omen two dead squirrels had been laying in the middle of the circle. Four days later, Ryan reached around a corner in his basement to turn off a light. He cut his right hand on a screw and had to go to the hospital for another 15 stitches to close the gash. Finally, about two weeks later, someone crashed into his newly repaired car. I'm just kind of wondering what's going to be next, he said. Halloween revelers carved jack-o'-lanterns and tried on grotesque masks and rites conjured up by ancients to ward off demons, but the specter of real-life evil spooked guardians of graveyards, chiches, and animal shelters. While children and adults prepared for a night of traditional parties and trick-or-treating, many authorities took measures to guard against vandalism by Halloween pranksters and the theft of church relics and pets by believers in the occult.
In Detroit, authorities imposed a dawn-to-dusk curfew aimed at thwarting the annual Devil's Night spree of arsons that has plagued the city in past years on Halloween Eve. Party shops sold out well ahead of the Saturday night holiday, with most customers picking costumes of wayward celebrities and horror movie stars. One outfitter in Denver said she couldn't keep up with the demand for eyelashes and padded shoulders for Tammy Faye backer costumes. In New Orleans, where weird costumes get as much wear as blazers in more sedate towns, the PTL theme was perhaps too tame. The most popular Halloween masquerades there were Freddy Krueger, the handy fellow in the movie Nightmare on Elm Street, and Jason of Friday the 13th, Infamy, said Sadie Isabel, costume maker for Joanne's Halloween Mardi Gras Center. Witches, skeletons, and devils used to be popular, but not anymore, Isabel said. People love the blood now. We sell more teeth and blood than anything. But grown-up debauchery hasn't entirely taken over the trick-or-treat tradition. Even little Jessica McLean, dressed as a kitten, will trick-or-treat in the Midland, Texas, hospital where the 18-month-old toddler has been staying since she was rescued from an abandoned well two weeks ago. Halloween pranks still focus on fires and outhouses, too, which disturbs Spencerport, New York, police. Officers there say they'll put our foot down about it this year to stop a decades-long tradition of torching an outhouse in the town. The Erie Canal Bar, generally considered the center of the mischief, will be closed for the night. Midwest authorities feared more serious trouble. A cult expert for Chicago police, Robert Simandl, warned that while revelers play, Satan worshippers will prowl for sacrifices. Guards will be posted at cemeteries and churches to ward off grave robbers and thieves seeking of holy relics, Simandl said. Some covens of witches and warlocks steal old bones and sacred vessels for occult rituals, he said. Animal shelters also were on the lookout. Idaho Humane Society director Roger Schmidt warned people to keep their pets indoors Halloween night especially cats to protect them from cultists who sacrifice or torture animals. Halloween and black cats kind of go hand in hand. They just go out, and they don't come back, Schmidt said. At Mokpala Cemetery in New York, magicians gathered at Harry Houdini's grave Friday to perform their traditional breaking of the wand ceremony, symbolizing that the master conjurer's powers died with him on Halloween 61 years ago. Others around the country hold annual seances trying to communicate with the soul of the famed escape eritist and magician. Halloween always brought out supernatural instincts, but the nighttime holiday wasn't spooky to ancient Celts and Romans who held celebrations around this time of year, said religion teacher James Robinson at the University of Northern Iowa. Halloween had a religious connotation because it falls on the eve of All Hallows, or All Saints, day, he said. Some also believed that evil and malicious spirits were out wandering around at that time, in contrast to the saints and blessed dead that would be celebrated the next day. Candles are lit at Halloween time as they were in olden times to light the path for spirits of the dead that were coming to honor a house with their presence, Robinson said. That's how the jack-o'-lantern came about, he said. The candle of Halloween was put inside a pumpkin carved with a grim face to frighten away the evil spirits, Robinson said. Jerusalem. Gershom Skolem the world's foremost authority on Jewish Kabbalah, or mysticism, died late Saturday, officials at Hebrew University said Sunday. He was 84. Skolem is credited with much of the original work this century placing the history of Kabbalah into its proper perspective through application of rigorous philosophical and academic standards. Kabbalah has been defined as an occult religious philosophy developed by certain rabbis in the Middle Ages, based on mystical interpretation of the scriptures. Previously, the Kabbalah has been misunderstood and often distorted by Jewish scholars, largely under the influence of rationalism, said Jeffrey Wigoder, editor of the Jewish Encyclopedia. It was Skolem who discovered new manuscripts, new writers, analyzed these and really placed them within the historical perspective. Among his numerous books and articles in a career that spanned more than half a century, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, published in 1941, became a standard reference work. His book on Sabbatees v. A false messiah who won thousands of adherents during the Middle Ages, became a popular history in the United States. Skolem was born in Berlin in 1897 and joined the Zionist movement as a young student. This, to him, implied a thorough understanding of Jewish historical, cultural, and religious traditions and eventually led him to his life's work. Skolem moved to Palestine after receiving his doctorate from the University of Munich in 1922. 
He joined the Jewish National and University Library in 1923 and became a lecturer at Hebrew University upon its founding in 1925. He held the post of Professor of Jewish Mysticism from 1933 until his retirement in 1965. He was a member of the Royal Academy of Holland, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Jewish Research. He is survived by his widow, Fania Freud. Tampa, Florida. A man taking flowers to his parents' graves on Good Friday discovered a family tomb had been hammered open and the bodies of his two three-year-old nephews were missing. The grave robbery is the second discovered in Tampa in less than a week. The Tampa Tribune reported Sunday that because the first grave robbery coincided with the spring equinox, police believe the thieves may have been looking for materials to use in satanic rituals. Has Dribble Arango entered Centro Asturiano Cemetery on Friday to lay flowers on the graves of his mother and father? But he forgot the clutch of red and yellow petals in his hand as he passed the crypt where his nephews, Rafael and Walter Arango Jr., were buried 64 years ago. The concrete box where mourners placed the coffins in 1925 had been hammered open and the coffins containing the two three-year-old boys' bodies were gone. I tell you, it's scary, said Arango. You've reached the end of the line when people do something like this. On Monday, vandals stole two coffins from Woodlawn Cemetery, which is near the Centro Asturiano Cemetery. Monday's raid coincided with the Vernal Equinox, an astrological event considered important in some ancient religions and among Satanists, police said. Arango does not know exactly when his nephew's tomb was robbed. I only come out here every two or three weeks, but the last time I was there, the crypt wasn't damaged, he said. A battered crypt also captured Tampa's attention the morning after Halloween last year, when a similar grave desecration was discovered at Woodlawn. Police said members of an occult group damaged an empty crypt and opened a coffin in a nearby vault and took some bones. Arango told cemetery authorities about the incident and said he plans to file a report with Tampa Police Monday. This is something that affects everybody, said Arango. There's a lot of people buried there. I felt terrible. It shocked me, yes it did. Lee, Massachusetts. The Passetto family, whose members said they were chased from their home by demons last month, will return next week now that a Roman Catholic priest has performed exorcism rites designed to purge the dwelling of the evil spirits. Luigi Passetto Jr., his wife Dale, and their two children moved from the two-story wood frame home in the small western Massachusetts town August 28 after they said they saw spirits, crucifixes being smashed and furniture rise into the air. The family contacted Edward and Lorraine Warren of Monroe, Con self-styled experts on demons who lecture nationwide on occult phenomenon who were involved with the so-called Amityville horror case on Long Island that became a book and movie. The Warrens said a priest, whom they refused to identify by name, conducted a two-hour exorcism Thursday. Friday, Dale Passetto said she had faith the religious ceremony had worked. We will be moving to the house, probably sometime next week, she said. Family members said they had experienced visitations by visible spirits, levitations of people and objects, including a refrigerator, and physical abuse. The Passettos described the spirits as a small boy dressed in white and a tall, evil-looking hooded thing. Officials from the Roman Catholic Diocese of nearby Springfield had refused to discuss the situation, but indicated priests from the diocese would not be involved in any religious ceremony at the home. During the exorcism the priest blessed the family, sprinkled holy water outside and inside the structure and said a traditional Latin mass in the living room, Warren said. Mrs. Warren said, during this period of time, there were certain individuals who felt a vibrating type of feeling in the floor. She said the cellar filled with smoke for no apparent reason. Following the religious ceremony, Mrs. Warren said, the priest told the group he was confident everything was gone from the home of a negative or demonic nature. She said the family would now be involved in religious and spiritual counseling with a priest. Mrs. Passetto said when the family visited the home after the exorcism Thursday, the whole house smelled of roses. I think that's a good sign. I have faith that it's gone. I have to believe the good Lord took care of it. She said. New York. James Randy ran his hands gently over the bare abdomen of the man prostrate upon the table before him. Suddenly, behind a cupped left hand, he drove his right hand deep into the flesh. Spectators gasped as blood spurted in a crimson arc. A malignant tumor, he said, apparently wrist deep in the vitals of his victim. It must come out. With that, he drew forth a gory goblet of flesh while still more blood poured from beneath his hands, 
Staining the Pristine Marble on the Floor at the Manhattan Townhouse of Bob Guccioni and Kathy Keaton, publishers of Omni Magazine which was sponsoring the demonstration. It was enough to make the strong Blanche and the weak seek other diversions. Randy, better known on the circuits of show business as The Amazing Randy, had just performed Psychic Surgery, a heartless ripoff by which he said charlatans in the Philippines annually extract as much as $42 million along with chicken livers, bits of hog bladder and even bloody mylar recording tape from the terminally ill. I'm a magician, he had said earlier. I'm a fake, a liar, a cheat and a fraud, but at least I do it with panache. Randy said the Filipino con men leave most of their victims, of whom the late Peter Sellers was one, to die untreated by conventional medicine after cheating them out of their money with sleight of hand surgery, but their brand of swindle is not the only one he wants to expose. He has harried phony psychics of every stripe for years and he hopes soon to be stripping them of their pretensions on prime time television. George Schlatter, who produces, Real People, for NBC, has been negotiating a television show with me based upon my investigation of the psychics and upon my book, Flim Flam, he said. I've found him to be a person of unusual integrity. He really means what he says and he's determined that the truth must be told and that would be the purpose of the whole project. In Randy's view, since television is guilty of turning a whole generation of Americans into gullible dupes in the first place, it is television's responsibility to reverse the process and salvage them. We are a generation raised and educated by the media, he said. We have been led to believe that Fran Tarkenton and Kathy Lee Crosby are intellectual giants. Any generation raised to spell relief, R-O-L-A-I-D-S cannot be in possession of all its marbles. Yet Randy is the first to admit that the universe is a mysterious place in which almost anything theoretically can happen. Incensed as he is at self-proclaimed psychics whose tricks are nothing more than any competent stage magician can perform, he goes on searching for some real evidence of the paranormal or the occult. To that end, he carries a signed check for $10,000 for anyone who can display powers he cannot duplicate. To date, no one including Yuri Geller, the Israeli psychic who claims he can bend spoons and fix watches through telekinesis has managed to take it away from him. I have several hundred psychics in my files who are wanting to be tested, he said. But I don't have the facilities to travel all over the world to test them. If I had the television program, I should be able to take a crew with me and travel to various parts of the country and the world. Randy said the show he envisions would do more than debunk psychic claims. He really would like to give away his $10,000. I want to do a show that investigates, he said. If the possibility of it being true is there, I want to know about that possibility. I want to establish that possibility and I want to broadcast it to the world. If I found someone who could levitate, I'd be thrilled. I'd give the $10,000 so fast I'd burn the check getting it out of the wallet. It would be worth every bit of it to me. I've searched for 35 years and I've offered the check for 18 years with no success so far. That doesn't mean that tomorrow I won't find a psychic and I'm always looking, but I'm always prepared to have the same old clap trap come up and hit me in the eye. What Randy has found is not sufficiently paranormal as to threaten his pocketbook, but it still excites him, and he said it would be made to order for a television audience. I'm interested in presenting to the American public some truly remarkable things, he said. There's a kid I know, that I discovered in Pittsburgh, who can actually extract square roots of 5 and 10 digit numbers in his head in less than 90 seconds, which is faster than you can do it with a calculator. There's another fellow I contacted. He's a doctor, but his hobby is reading phonograph records. You give him a recording on which the label has been covered and he'll tell you the composer and the music that's on it. It's not trickery. I know because I tested him. Until something truly occult comes along, Randy said such phenomenal powers of the mind are more than enough. Reality is here now and it is remarkable, he said. Think of it. You walked on the moon. Now, you didn't, personally but our species did. We sent a guy out there and he got out of a telephone booth like thing on stilts and he picked up samples and he came back and he's here now and he can tell us about it. That is absolutely remarkable. It's an astounding achievement. The only thing that infuriates Randy as much as charlatans who prey upon the ill and the gullible are television shows that prey upon their viewers' credulity which is another reason why he covets a showcase of his own. I have great hopes that some network is going to be smart enough to realize, hey, it's about time we started to square and level with people instead of giving them, that's incredible and in search of, he said. Claptrap. Let's get some of the reality of life and celebrate the reality of life. Get rid of all the sludge and you're left with gold.
That's what I'm after the gold. Austin, Texas. A defense lawyer urged jurors Wednesday not to convict Paul Stedman Cullen of poisoning the historic Treaty Oak, saying Cullen was a loser who took credit for the vandalism because he was trying to impress a woman. That's the key to the entire case. Paul thought of himself as a loser, said attorney Terry Kirk. I don't think there was any doubt he had low self-esteem. He wanted her to think he was somebody. Jurors began deliberating the fate of Cullen, 46, who was charged with felony criminal mischief in the case. A guilty verdict could land him a life sentence because of previous burglary convictions. The Stubbenville, Ohio, native was accused of pouring the herbicide Velpar around the base of Treaty Oak, a historic live oak tree in West Austin. The poisoning attack has left most of the tree dead, but part of the giant oak is still alive and experts are hopeful it will survive. The Treaty Oak, one of the few survivors of a stand of trees called the Council Oaks, was considered a spiritual tree by the Indians, who gathered beneath its sprawling limbs 100 years ago. It has been an Austin landmark since the days of founder Stephen F. Austin. The tree, once called the most perfect live oak specimen in North America, is believed to be from 300 to 400 years old. Don't find Paul guilty. He didn't do it, said Kirk. He took credit for it, but he didn't do it. Kirk also argued to the jury that the state's key witness, Cindy Blacko, lied to collect a $10,000 reward in the case. The only witch in this case is Cindy Blacko, he said. I think that greed took hold of her, and I think she came into this courtroom and lied to you. Prosecutors alleged that Cullen poisoned the tree as part of an occult ritual to impress a woman. Blacko taped recorded a conversation in which Cullen discussed poisoning the tree, and traces of the potent Velpar were found in his pickup truck. Assistant District Attorney Kent Onschutz reminded the jury that Blacko went to police before the reward was reported in the media, and accused the defense of engaging in speculation. Onschutz also ridiculed the testimony of a surprise defense witness who testified Tuesday that she saw two men other than Cullen pouring jugs of liquid around the base of the tree at about the same time it was poisoned with Velpar. Wanda Garcia said she was walking past the tree in February or March of 1989 when she saw the men pouring a liquid around the tree. However, she said she never called the police or prosecutors after the poisoning became no because she had numerous personal problems last year. Cullen was living in the back of a truck in nearby Elroy when he was arrested June 29, 1989. He has been in custody since that time on a $20,000 bond. Porto Prince, Haiti. Swiss pharmacists claim to have discovered the secret formula for making a zombie but they have a long way to go before they can transform people into the walking dead, Haitian voodoo priests say. The voodoo practitioners said Sunday they did not believe the pharmacists could have gotten hold of the well-guarded secret of transforming people into the walking dead. They, the pharmacists, have a long way to go, one voodoo priest told United Press International in response to news reports carried Saturday by Haitian newspapers. According to Superstition, a zombie is a corpse that supposedly is brought to a state of trance-like animation through the supernatural. The news report, citing Swiss pharmaceutical sources, supported Haitian skeptics who believe a secret venomous potion is administered by voodoo priests to create a form of paralysis that resembles death. The skeptics believe another secret potion is administered after burial to resurrect the human as a zombie. Recently, purported zombies have been shown on Haitian television and zombies have been the subject of serious discussion by Haitian scientists. Haitians, although secretive about it, practice voodoo religiously at the family level and voodoo priests, who claim the power of life and death, are both feared and respected. The practice of voodoo, with African roots, extends throughout the Caribbean and Brazil. San Mateo, California. A four-foot-tall robot with a fishbowl head picketed the San Mateo County Courthouse with a sign saying, Divorce Court's Unfair. The robot, named DC2, sang the blues about a problem nobody knew robots had. She got the gold mine. I got the shaft. A human woman, possibly with divorce problems, whispered something to DC2 and walked on. County Supervisor Ed Bachaco, twice divorced, said he might hire DC2 for some political campaigning. This must be the most unusual assignment we've had yet, said Jean Belly, who created DC2 and owns Android Amusement Corp., Monrovia, California, I think it's the first time a robot ever picketed anywhere. The company sells and leases androids and other robots. DC2 handed out flyers Tuesday in which Ritz Miller complained about delays and high costs of divorce. Some courts can promote hate that not even a robot can accept, the flyer said. 
Belly was on hand with his robot and could give it a remote control voice. DC2 wheeled up to an elderly man and asked, What's your wife like, sir? Well, said the man, I'm married to a robot. She doesn't look like me, though, does she? DC2 inquired. Oh yes, she does, the man said said. Miller had paid $1,000 to hire the robot for a day. Eknastjan, Sweden. The hitchhiking ghost, reported in Arkansas earlier this year, has turned up in southern Sweden where he is making reckless drivers out of local folk. Police said Thursday many drivers have reported picking up a young man who talked about the second coming of Christ. Then, without opening the door, the hitchhiker suddenly disappeared without a trace, drivers said. As a result of these reports, drivers are speeding down roads without regard to traffic signals, police said. Or, they go miles out of their way to avoid a spot they they call the ghost's favorite intersection for catching a lift. Police have been flooded with calls asking about the mysterious traveler, but have yet to start an official probe. However, local priests are taking it seriously and pursuing investigations. Alcohol is not suspected by the police as Sweden's strict drunken driving laws make it an unlikely cause of the mysterious appearances. In Arkansas earlier this year, motorists reported picking up a similar hitchhiker who said he was Christ, and who disappeared from their cars. Lyons, Kansas. Phyllis and Lauren Wines have been delighted to receive roses for the past 10 Christmases, but they sure would like to know who is sending them. This year the flowers, two red roses and individual brandy snifters, came a day early instead of the usual Christmas Eve delivery. As usual, however, the flowers were accompanied with the note, from your admirers. Mrs. Wines said she and her husband have questioned every friend and relative, going all the way back to fourth cousins, but haven't discovered the mysterious admirer. They all deny sending it, she said Wednesday. We don't have the vaguest idea where they come from. Everybody in town knows but us. The owner of the local flower shop has refused to name the mysterious gift giver. The wines tried playing detective by sending a return gift of tulips on St. Valentine's Day, and then nosing around their friends' houses to see who had the flowers. But they still haven't cracked the case. Curious is hardly the word for it anymore, Mrs. Wines said. It's getting to the point where I'm ready for some confessions. Baltimore. A mysterious visitor slipped into the graveyard under the cover of darkness early Tuesday morning leaving behind the traditional birthday gifts of roses and Martell's cognac for horror writer Edgar Allan Poe and a cryptic message that left the Poe watchers baffled. The hunched over man, dressed in a black overcoat and hat and walking with a slight limp, arrived at the Westminster Presbyterian Church graveyard at 5.05 a.m. Just as he has done every year since 1949, he carried a brown paper sack from which he took a bottle of Martell's cognac and a bouquet of three red roses with baby's breath. But this time, after paying homage to Poe, he dropped at the foot of the tombstone a note concealed in an envelope used by the Poe House and Museum to issue tickets to the previous weekend's birthday celebration. The note, addressed to Jeff Jerome, curator of the museum, was typed on an old manual typewriter that put holes in the pale blue note paper and read. My dear Mr. Jerome. It seems we've both become Baltimore traditions. I'm content that some traditions must pass while others take their place. The torch will be passed. It was signed, your friend in Poe. Jerome was mystified by the message. It was exciting to see him again, but I don't know what to make of this, he said. Maybe he was overwhelmed by the Poe celebration. We'll have to wait until next year, to see if he continues the ritual, dot. Nerves were on edge and eyes began to droop as the witnesses waited inside the church, watching for the mysterious visitor to make an appearance. Jerome even expressed pessimism that he might not show as the dawn approached since it was his habit to arrive by 3.15 a.m. Earlier in the evening, an intruder got through the gates and headed straight for Poe's grave. Fearing he would scare off the visitor, Jerome and his comrades escorted the man outside the gate. Shortly before midnight, a trio scaled the fence to lay roses in a silver-framed poem at the base of Poe's marker. Roseanne Sanders, of Dayton, Ohio, had taken a week's vacation to make her first pilgrimage to Poe's grave. She wrote the poem to Poe several years ago, and wanted the writer to have it. It was extremely emotional, she said. I feel as if he is my soul mate. After being escorted outside the cemetery walls, she stood near the gate, reading from her favorite Poe works The Raven and Alone. I wanted to celebrate his birthday with him and maybe catch a glimpse of the mysterious man. I feel his soul still lives. Since 1949, the mysterious visitor has made a sudden appearance at the gravesite, kneels, appears to pray, 
then touches the white marble monument and leaves. The cognac is a favorite drink of the visitor Poe had a blood sugar disorder that made him ill when drinking alcohol, although he was known for occasional overindulgence. The three roses are presented in memory of Poe, his wife Virginia and Aunt Marie Poe Clem, who are buried with him beneath the marble gravestone at the entrance to the cemetery. New Delhi, India Monkey Man strikes again at least 16 people have been injured after they were allegedly mauled and attacked Thursday by a mysterious ape-like creature in several parts of the Indian capital. A baffled New Delhi police have formed a special crack team of agile officers to nab the elusive monkey man who has killed at least two people and injured more than 50 people over the past few days. Lubeck, Maine Marine researchers found a ninth Atlantic white-sided dolphin beached in an eastern Maine cove, but said they believed the worst of the mysterious dolphin suicides was over. Nine dolphins, including the immature male found Tuesday, have been found dead in beachings since last Thursday in a mysterious ritual that has occurred every six years to the week in the same area since 1975. Researchers plan to continue searching today for more dolphins, including a tenth mammal reportedly beached on Deer Island. A fog that had hampered the search lifted Tuesday. That's going to help a great deal, said Dorothy Sparrow, director of the West Quadi Marine Station, a private research center. I honestly believe if we can get through tomorrow we'll be okay. We're through the worst of it. We haven't seen any live animals today. That doesn't mean they're dead, it just means they may be gone. As long as they're not too far into Cobb's Cook Bay, I think they're all right. All we can do is look. Local fishermen and clamors working around the bay continued to look for the dolphins despite the foggy conditions Tuesday. About 120 dolphins have been spotted in the area. The marine station planned to extend through the weekend its coastal alert for fishermen and residents to look for any beached mammals or dolphins swimming near coves, Sparrow said. Once the beaching crisis is over, Sparrow and researchers at Boston's New England Aquarium will try to find out why similar beachings have occurred every six years. In 1975, 200 died in coves off Lubeck and in 1981, 50 dolphins beached themselves. Volunteers saved 43 of the 50. Singapore Thai doctors have started working in Singapore to keep tabs on the health of laborers from Thailand, 17 of whom have died in their sleep under mysterious circumstances, officials said Sunday. Operating out of the Thai labor office, the physicians are advising workers about dietary deficiencies, distributing first aid kits and answering questions from frightened Thais who do not speak English and have difficulty communicating with local doctors. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew granted permission for the Thai physicians to work in Singapore on the condition that they only treat Thai nationals. Health officials from Singapore and Thailand have spent months visiting construction sites, interviewing workers, and pondering possible causes of the deaths, with the phenomenon named the Sudden Unexplained Nocturnal Death Syndrome. More than 200 Thai males have died in Singapore since 1983 but the cause of the mysterious deaths has never been found. There have been three similar deaths of Thais in Malaysia since January, 18 deaths in Brunei over the past year and 600 in Saudi Arabia since 1975. Officials said teams of doctors would serve in Singapore on a rotating basis. The first seven doctors asked the workers about their health and diet and taught them cardiopulmonary resuscitation techniques. All of the victims apparently healthy males ranging in age from 21 through 45 have died in their sleep after experiencing breathing difficulties. Autopsies have rendered no clues, leaving physicists with no option but to list the cause of the deaths as cardiac failures. There are 30,000 Thais currently working in Singapore, primarily on construction projects, but the flurry of unexplained deaths has sparked an exodus of many back to Thailand. Government officials and contractors here have heatedly denied accusations from Thai politicians that squalid living conditions may be responsible for the deaths. Kitzingen, West Germany at midnight the U.S. soldiers gather before the Batadorn tomb, waiting for Count Dracula to emerge on his vampire prowl in search of victims who will provide life-sustaining blood. I have worked here for many years, and the Dracula tomb has always been there, said Annalise Funk, spokeswoman for the 7,000-strong 3rd Infantry Division unit in Kitzingen. It is kind of scary, a little old and a little mysterious, painted and with a fence like a shrine, she said. It is the first thing soldiers ask about when they get here she said. The imagination of the G.I.s has been captured by a 19th-century family grave decorated with bats and skulls amid Old Testament scenes, military spokesmen, and city authorities said Thursday. I haven't been down there at night, but lots of guys sit there waiting to see him get out, said a skeptical Sergeant Robert Richard, of Lafayette, 
L.A., I don't know if they really think they'll see him, but when somebody is convinced, perhaps they can make it happen. The G.I.s disregard an important part of vampire lore, which says Dracula's home was in Transylvania, a Romanian province some 700 miles east of this southern German wine town. Mayor Rudolf Schart, overwhelmed by the interest in his sleepy little town of 18,000, patiently pointed out that the mysterious grave is the resting place of a merchant family by the name of Harold. Before the city restored the tomb a couple of years ago, the bats and skulls were very faint, and it had an eerie atmosphere, he said. That is probably how it got started. But the mayor said he realized that could do little to combat the GI vampire craze because you can't stop these young fellows from believing what they want. What if a vampire should rise? Garlic supposedly wards vampires off, but Sergeant Richard said he didn't know whether the vampire watchers used it for deterrence at their vigils. I don't think they're really scared, he said.